welcome, uh, Dr. Swangia, other distinguished guests, both present and online, one and all. Uh, so welcome to this, the Richard Cooper Memorial Lecture for 2023. For those of you who are wondering what I look like, I'm, I'm Rick Bigwood, I'm the Dean of the TC Byrne School of Law at UQ, and judging by your silence, you're not disappointed um, <laughs> with, with what you see, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, before proceeding, I'd like to pause to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the unceded land upon which we meet this evening. These are the people of the, of the Yarraga and Turrbal nations of Leandian, which we now call Brisbane. I pay my respects to the elders past and existing, and I extend the same respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending here this evening. I acknowledge the contemporary Queensland First Nations community who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So by way of background, the annual Richard Cooper Memorial Lecture is a joint initiative of the UQ Law School and the Federal Court of Australia. This lecture series was established in 2005 in honour of the late Honourable Justice Richard Cooper of the Federal Court of Australia, who passed away suddenly on 14 March 2005. The series is dedicated to the strong interest in maritime law and native title law that Justice Cooper developed over the course of a long and distinguished legal career. His memory, of course, is kept alive through his multiple contributions to Australian jurisprudence while he was on the court, and uh, since his passing, his, his memory uh, continues, of course, by through this uh, memorial lecture series, as well as through the Richard Cooper Scholarship, which is administered annually by the law school. My almost singular task um, here is to uh, invite the Honourable Justice Daryl Rangia of the Federal Court of Australia to the lectern to introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight. I'm delighted and would like to extend my own gratitude to our, our speaker and indeed my colleague, since he's an adjunct professor at uh, the UQ Law School. Uh, I'd like to thank him for so graciously accepting my offer to deliver the um, uh, lecture tonight. He was my first choice, of course, and, uh, and he accepted despite his very demanding uh, schedule. I'd like to welcome Justice Ranger to the, to the podium. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, distinguished guests. I note President Smith's presence. Um, now, uh, when I was a barrister, I appeared regularly before Justice Cooper in the federal court. He was a brilliant judge, and I found him to have a, a dry wit and a great capacity for understatement. Uh, I was reminded of this um, recently because uh, I moved chambers on level eight and the chambers are now occupy, were previously occupied by Justice Andrew Greenwood and before that by Justice Cooper. Now when I open up the cupboard where my robes are stored, um, there's a small brass plaque on the inside of the door and it was placed there by Justice Cooper and it speaks to one of his great areas of interest in the law, which was admiralty in maritime law. And the plaque says, um, a collision at sea can ruin your entire day. <laughs> I thought it was perhaps typical of Justice Cooper's um, understated humor. Um, his other great interest uh, in law was um, native title, and that's why we're here today. I'm very pleased to have been asked to introduce our speaker for the 2023 Richard Cooper Memorial Lecture. Our system in Australia for the resolution of native title claims has developed to the point where it has become very efficient. That efficiency is demonstrated, for example, by the fact that there have been approximately 590 native title determinations made to date. However, in the quest for efficiency, uh, some people can be left behind. And sometimes the system can operate in a very cruel way. We are fortunate this evening to have adjunct professor Jonathan Fulcher discussing the effect of the native title system on those people 
those people who are left behind. Professor Torcher is an eminent lawyer. He has degrees in history and law from the University of Queensland and a PhD in history from Cambridge University. He has been a partner at Hopgood Gannam Lawyers for 13 years and is currently the national head of resources, energy and native title. He tells me that his favorite things about being a lawyer in private practice are the independence it provides, the role of being a trusted advisor and working with enthusiastic, smart, younger lawyers. Professor Fulcher is married to Dr. Michelle Fulcher, who's here today, um, who is a senior anthrop anthropologist originally from Canada. They have two children, James and Elizabeth, uh, a dog named Lucy and cats named Hamlet and Horatio. Now, this is the second Richard Cooper Memorial Lecture Professor Fulcher has given. In 2015, he weighed into the constitutional recognition debate by suggesting that an equality before the law provision should be added to the Constitution. His paper was published in the Australian Law Journal. He is highly regarded as one of Australia's leading native title lawyers. Please welcome adjunct professor Jonathan Fulcher. Your honours, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and Rick. <laughs> before, my, before I begin, allow me to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening. I know that I'm supposed to refer to the Turrbal and Yuggera people when thus paying my respects but I acted pro bono for the Yagara Yugurupal people in Sandy in the state of Queensland, in which ultimately this court decided that the Turrbal people were from Gainda and the Yagara people were from southwest of Logan through to Ipswich to the eastern side of the bottom of Toowoomba Range and that native title had ceased to exist in the greater Brisbane area from Petrie down to Logan. This presents a challenge to those of us who do not wish for a moment to cause any offence to those two groups of people, but who swore an oath to uphold the rule of law and be an officer of the court. I nevertheless pay my respects to Maruchi Baramba and Uncle Des Sandy and honour them and their families here tonight. Bad news. Graham Neat passed away this year. For those of you who don't, do not know him, Graham was a long serving president of the NNTT Acknowledged President Smith was, well, now fills those shoes. But in a strange way, more importantly, he was a great friend and colleague to anyone who thought deeply about their practice of native title. I took over the authorship of Fallsbury's Laws of Australia Cultural Heritage Chapters from Graham, and the depth of his scholarship was scary to behold. Graham literally footnoted almost every sentence in 200 pages covering every jurisdiction in Australia's cultural heritage rules. I thought about him while trying to write this paper because I would otherwise have reached out to him to discuss where I was headed with it. He always had time for people and was intensely interested in and respectful of all of the stakeholders in the native title system. He will surely be sorely missed. This lecture honours the life and career of his honour, Justice Cooper, as Rick mentioned. I do hope I do some justice to his legacy here and pay my respects to his family. I am honoured to say that this is my second time of being asked to do this and thank Rick, Chief Justice Mortimer and Justice Rangier for this opportunity for me to take a second bite of the cherry. No doubt some might say I've been in the native title system far too long since 1994. Yes, I can see you all doing the maths, realizing it's 30 years next year. I had hoped to catch up with my friend and colleague, David Yarrow, here tonight. David and I worked for Dominic McGann in the Department of Lands in 1994, and David and I have paralleled each other's careers since then. David has COVID, so could not travel, but I understand he might be online. So if you are David, get well soon. This lecture provides an opportunity to reflect on the past 30 years, but also to look at current issues in a deeper fashion than private practice usually allows. 
I want to start with a quote from H.L.A. Hart. The form of that sentence as a rhyming couplet should not create any expectation that the rest of the lecture will be given in that form. In a discussion of laws and morals, at page 197 to 198 of the concept of law, Hart reflected on what he referred to as a sobering truth. And I quote, the step from the simple form of society where primary rules of obligation are the only means of social control into the legal world with its centrally organized legislature, courts, officials, and sanctions brings its solid gains, but at a certain cost. The gains are those of adaptability to change, certainty and efficiency, as Justice Rengia mentioned, and these are immense gains. The cost is at the risk that the centrally organized power may well be used for the oppression of numbers with whose support it can dispense in a way that the simpler regime of primary rules could not. I want to apply this idea more narrowly to aspects of our native title system. Unlike some commentators, I don't use the word system pejoratively. The native title system, in my estimation, is both, to quote the Macquarie Dictionary, an assemblage or combination of things or parts forming a complex or unitary whole, and an ordered and comprehensive assemblage of facts, principles, doctrines, or the like in a particular field of knowledge or thought. It has produced the solid gains Hart refers to, adaptability to change, certainty, and efficiency. Some may think that the mountain of decisions in the courts on native title matters since 1992 are hardly certain or efficient. Objectively, however, the rules promulgated by parliaments and the courts have led to a significant number of determinations of native title and agreements made in historical terms in an extremely quick time and with a quite comparably rapid clarification of legal ambiguity that has been good commercially and good at least for those with successful determinations or relatively lucrative agreements. That in, in itself has happened over literally one generation. And if you compare that to other jurisdictions, it's a remarkably quick um, process that, that's occurred uh, with the system that has been adopted and created. Today, however, I want to concentrate on the risk that Hart refers to that the centrally organised power, in this case the various institutions which prosecute claims for native title or engage in the agreement making aspects of the native title system, may well be used for, quote, the oppression of numbers with whose support it can dispense. In other words, I want to look at who might be missing out in the native title system and why they might be missing out. I am not here interested to reassess judgments where the court has declared that native title does not exist or in which matters or claims are dismissed according to law. That is the proper function of the courts, to do justice between the parties according to law. Extensive reasons are published to explain the decisions publicly. There are rights of appeal, and in some, albeit rare cases, judges may call for law reform. Justice McHugh, for instance, in Ward at paragraph 561, and Justice Rangier more recently in the Gungaloo matter from paragraph 1242. What concerns me here is the extent of native title claimants that miss out before the native title determination application even reaches court. My pro bono practice, and I'm sure those of colleagues here, are inundated with people wanting legal assistance because they have been cut out. What's known as 66 bead, probably the worst gerund ever created, both in its blithe shorthandedness for what is a kind of social shame or social ostracism for those on the receiving end of a section 66B process for alleged wrongdoing by a member of an applicant group and for its torturing of the English language. Having a place in the sun as a native title holder in one determination, but cut out of another, or worse, having the identity you grew up with through oral history from your parents or grandparents taken away from you and then either not being explained to you or it being explained to you in a recondite legalese that means something to the explainer, but nothing to the recipient of the explanation. Couple these things with connection material being made available to applicants for native title claims only in the land council office, 
without the ability to copy or take away the material, and you have aspects of a system which must be at least bewildering to those the system is meant to serve, the native title holders. Using legal professional privilege, privilege privacy or confidentiality to hamstring access to material about the connectedness of the very people who are making the claim seems to me arbitrary and unreasonable, whatever the legal or privacy reasons, reasons that are used to justify the practice. It is inadvertence that my title, Epistemology and Accountability under the Native Title Act, may lead some to believe that I was, when framing the summary notes for the lecture, channeling Michel Foucault in his work on the relationship between power and knowledge. I am not a fan of the incomprehensibility of Francophone philosophy, so please do not think that I'm basing this lecture on my theory on theories about the relationship between the way knowledge claims are fashioned in part by power relations. But I think nevertheless it is possible in the time-honored time -honored but muddled Anglophone way to show in the native title system how power relations, particularly in native title rep bodies, from now on I'll refer to them by the colloquial term rep bodies, and state governments can lead to the presentation of evidence that serves interests not directly benefiting from the prosecution of the land claims. The privileging of certain traditional knowledge over other traditional knowledge can be achieved by the way in which lawyers, historians, and anthropologists shape and frame knowledge claims which form the core allegations in a native title determination application. Before I begin the analysis of how come people come to be left behind when the system dispenses with their support, I want to make it clear that I'm not criticizing the work of any of the people in rep bodies or in state governments. Those people work under strained, under-resourced circumstances for the good of their clients. They do so with the best of intentions and with the interests of their clients always to heart. But the system requires a decision as to who the clients are. And that decision is determined by an assessment of who is most likely to be necessary to be included in a claim for it to have the best chance of success by political decisions the rep bodies and governments make, both in relation to the best use to be made of the funding provided, to prosecute the claims and internal political strategy of the land council or state, usually acting through the Crown Solicitor's Office in the case of the latter. My thesis is rather that the more privileged by the system a knowledge claim is, the less accountability there is and the less accountability there needs to be given to those whom the system is designed to serve. I'm suggesting that the very structure of the system and its outcomes inexorably create knowledge haves and knowledge have nots. I will explain the types of knowledge claims which are made, then who makes them, and only then the level of privilege accorded to those claims. This is the epistemological section of the paper. The level of privilege accorded by the system to a knowledge claim determines the extent to which the court may have regard to the knowledge claim in determining native title. In court, the lay evidence of the traditional owners comes into its own, but the extent to which it has been leavened by the privileging of a knowledge claim well before the evidence comes to court remains unknown to the court. In fact, it is unknowable by the court. To, Kate, to quote Kate Glaskin in her forensic analysis of the process of making a, making a native title claim in relation to the Bardi and Jawi peoples in her book Cross Currents, and I quote, in litigated claims, the facts upon which a judge will ultimately make their decision depend on a complex interaction between applicant and expert evidence, procedural issues, such as how applicant evidence is elicited and how cases are run and argued, and interpretations of the ethnographic and historical record. This means that what is taken to be a fact or allegation is necessarily already a judgment of some kind. She goes on to explain that scholarly attention often concentrates on the outcome of the case, the written decision. However, she explains, Quote, what usually remains invisible, except to those who are participants in a case, is the historical context of claims and claimant groups, front and backstage aspects of the hearing, the impact of evolving case law and legal strategies, and pleas that also contribute to the outcome of a case. We need more examples of analysis like this to make more transparent what Glaskin refers to as exploring a native title claim and its resulting decisions as a, quote, social process. After that, we'll look at the question, 
To whom are the more or less privileged knowledge claimers accountable? This is where I will attempt to show the relationship between the privileging of knowledge claims and what might be characterised as the gradual watering down of accountability. We will round out with some suggestions as to how we might address, as Hart puts it, the oppression of those whom the centralising power can dispense with in order to gain certainty, efficiency and adaptability for change, uh, to change for those from as many or as many of those affected by the native title system as possible. The actors that make knowledge claims in a native title claim include historians, anthropologists, lawyers and common law native title holders. The expert evidence provided by historians and anthropologists is not presented ready made and without change for the lawyers to work up into allegations of fact about which they seek to persuade the fact finder, that is the judge. This is inherently a collaboration, as Glaskin remarks, quote, to win the case. Again, I, I don't, do not at, this, at the outset wish it to be inferred by anyone that this collaboration is somehow a problem. The lawyers have to present the evidence in the best light to win the case. But the nexus between the historian and the lawyers and the anthropologists and the lawyers is really what constitutes the social process Glaskin refers to in fashioning lay and anthropological or historical expert testimony. Some examples will help to understand these relationships in the production of evidence to be put before the court. As a former practicing historian, I've already written about this relationship uh, to my, in relation to my experience as an historian uh, for the state of Queensland in the WIC case. The use of history in WIC was present-centred and lacked, quote, a full examination of the sources and scholarship related to the history of land settlement in Australia and in other British colonies settled at a similar time. Beaumont Jay in Anderson and Wilson, the Western Lands Act case, had a postscript addressing historical evidence, including material I had prepared for the pastoralist, but the three full court justices did not see the historical evidence as necessarily determinative in native title cases. However, Justice Gordon of the High Court has written more recently uh, in definitive terms as to the importance of historical facts for the shaping of native title jurisprudence. Australia's pre-colonial history is central to and intertwined with accurate Indigenous history, she has written. And I go on, the significance of the more recent discoveries and narratives cannot be overstated. Her Honour argues that archaeological and historical work continues to shape and should continue to shape native title law. This is an important corrective from the treatment of history by the courts previously but is more about the shaping of native title jurisprudence as a whole than the application of history in the determination of facts by the court in specific proceedings. Historical claims to knowledge have always been contingent, contested and constrained. History has never quite achieved the status of a social science, and I'm speaking as a paid practicing historian. Claims to knowledge can be made authoritatively, but as we have seen, can come up against the different concerns and evidentiary processes of a court. It seems that historians and lawyers can work together to produce an historical framework in which to place native title holders lay evidence, but historical facts are peculiarly open to contestation in a way that anthropologists' evidence is less likely to experience. I say less likely, even though obviously anthropological experts disagree about cultural and genealogical evidence. Nowhere was this on show better than in the Lake Torrens overlap proceeding at first instance. Significant disputation between anthropological reports were exhaustively examined by Mansfield Jay in that case. His honour extrapolated from his review of the contested anthropological evidence that, quote, sometimes the line between, between opinion and argument is hard to discern. This proposition was readily agreed to by counsel in the proceedings. In those proceedings, the normative content of Western Desert society was under discussion. The lay witness evidence was framed by the anthropological reports. The anthropologist's claim to a scientific approach to research is rooted in participant observation, not a one-way activity, but a relationship of researcher and people studied, which is collaborative and reciprocal. 
anthropologists expressly speak of a scientific method. The importance ascribed to observation as the main data yielding procedure derives directly from anthropology's ideas about the constitution of its subject matter, which like the subject matter of natural science should be directly observable, as well as from its insistence on empirical scholarship characteristic of science. That's just from an ethnographic text, textbook. There are broader and more ambitious knowledge claims than historians feel capable of making. The anthropological method is a professedly scientific method, research, verification, historical context, and an ethical dimension of not taking sides and doing no harm. But in the native title system, it is when historians with their modest epistemological capacities and anthropologists with their more ambitious claims to practice of a social science come into contact with lawyers and the legal process that these knowledge claims are tested. The adversarial system requires the lawyer to characterize evidence into a narrative argument that meets the evidentiary requirements of the case. There are rules of evidence which govern the knowledge claims. When the fact is determined to be so by the judge, it is given the imprimatur of a fact and is an authoritative knowledge. The authority of the court derived from the sovereignty of the state imbues that fact with the status of known fact. Then the law can be applied to the, those facts without fear of slippage of those authoritative facts losing their characterization as known facts. This can be challenging for academic researchers. I recall saying to instructing solicitors in the matters where I've been an expert historical witness that I was uncomfortable with court submissions, cherry picking facts from historical research to um, receive the imprimatur of the court for those facts in a matrix of fact and law. That characterization of a fact receiving court authority seemed to me to be a breach of the historian's professional responsibility to ensure that findings remained modest and provisional consistent with an historian's usually diffident knowledge claims. Historians are always conscious that other historical evidence may come to light, which challenges the characterization given to that fact by the narrative in which the historian has put that fact to make an historical argument about what happened. Justice Rangier has written in 2016 about the same issue with respect to anthropological written and oral evidence prepared for native title claim proceedings. His Honour asks anthropologists to think about the audience for their land claim connection report. And I quote, you are not writing a report for yourself and you are not writing it for other anthropologists. You are writing it for the lawyers who have engaged you. You are writing it for the members of the native title claim group. Ultimately, however, you are engaged to write a report for the purposes of a native title proceeding and your audience is the judge who will decide the case. And his honour makes it very clear at uh, page four of that paper that, quote, an expert anthropological uh, anthropologist cannot stay aloof from the legal issues involved in the case, nor can lawyers be divorced from anthropological issues. The instructions given to anthropologists by lawyers are vitally important. His honour explains the process of concurrent oral evidence. Questions are prepared and then his honour asks the ex expert those questions both experts being on the witness stand at the same time. If the experts descend to advocacy rather than providing expert testimony, the judge's confidence in the expert is undermined. We now must turn to the knowledge claims made by native title holders. These are obviously fundamental to native title claim proceedings. Given the, given the necessity of demonstrating connection to country, and the existence of a normative society which has existed substantially uninterrupted since the acquisition of sovereignty, these hurdles are a high bar to get over. I will not join the chorus of voices raising concerns about Yorta Yorta tonight, except to refer to Justice Rangier's recent call for reform to be able to find that native title was held by a particular group of people at sovereignty, if not in the present. My concern tonight, however, is to suggest that lay evidence of this kind is often prepared by lawyers to fit the categories of the case with ethnographic and oral history testimony that simply cannot bear the weight of what is required to meet the common law tests. This is problematic. 
The best way to explain what I am on about here is an illustration. Jeremy Beckett, a well-known doyen of Torres Strait anthropology, has examined the issue of Koiki Mabo's credibility as it was questioned by Justice Moynihan in the trial of facts in the Supreme Court of Queensland, which started this whole system. Justice Moynihan, suffice it to say, did not trust Mabo's evidence. Beckett got the impression that the judge regarded Mr. Mabo as, quote, a political activist who, seeing the main chance, made up for his lack of roots on Murr with reading books. Beckett is more sympathetic to Mr. Mabo than the judge was. Because of his reading of Merriam anthropology, starting with the Cambridge reports from the late 19th century, Mr. Mabo knew Beckett's word, and Beckett puts that word in quotes, Mr. Mabo knew more than other Merriam people about their past. Quote, at the same time he, again, knew it in a different way, not as something that had come to him just as in the course of growing up on Murr, but for knowledge for which he had searched. Beckett ultimately finds this ironic. While anthropologists become credible expert witnesses by writing, natives, and that's in quotes, render themselves inauthentic by reading. Tainted with literacy, it seems they can't, like Mr. Marbo, go home again. As actors in the native title system, we cannot have it both ways. We cannot at the same time expect lay witnesses to be traditional and have all sorts of traditional knowledge that neatly fits the categories native title proceedings require, and then discount their contemporary engagement with their own history, merely because that somehow renders their traditional knowledge less authentic. The case is one or lost in the extent to which that process of characterization of their evidence by lawyers and anthropologists is sufficient to win their case. Lay witnesses ought not to be expected to win the case on their own. It is the marshalling of that evidence in a narrative that characterises their traditional knowledge as that which meets the common law tests, which is the job of the lawyers in their nexus with historians and anthropologists. Lay witnesses are entitled to learn about their history and make claims to knowledge about their connection to country in the very process of reviewing the case prepared on their behalf. So much for knowledge claims. We now need to look at where these claims are made. And so we move from the nexus between the players in the native title drama to the locus of where that nexus is forged in rep bodies and in the state government. In these two loci of applicant and respondent, we confront the issue of accountability. We have seen how lay witnesses themselves cannot win cases on their own. They need experts and lawyers to help them but those experts operate in institutional environments. Since Julie Finlayson first identified the cross currents of indigenous kinship and community politics on the one hand, and representativeness demanded by the NTA in 1998, rep bodies have changed. In the early years of native title, rep bodies had governance problems that Finlayson identified involving board members meddling in operational matters. With the structural changes to rep bodies in more recent times where service provision of native title claim prosecution has taken over from the kinds of political advocacy undertaken in earlier times, these governance problems have largely disappeared. I say largely, however, because there are still examples of the regional composition of rep body boards leading to interventions in land claims. One group I act for in relation to their future act matters has struggled for years with what they perceive as unwarranted intervention by their rep body in the determination of their land claim. The applicant in the matter to which I refer was told that if a particular apical ancestor was not added to their determination, the rep body would litigate against the applicant. It just so happened that that apical ancestor was a forebear of a board member of the rep body. Now these things are difficult to prove, due not only to a lack of transparency in some rep bodies, but also because of the lack of resources of the applicant involved in their land claim. Whether this is an isolated incident or not is impossible to judge from any one vantage point. It is entirely possible that there is nothing untoward about that, that intervention based on the anthropological research for the claim. I merely raise this as an, as an example of how, if the applicant is right, 
the locus of decision making in a rep body may drive behaviours which lead to either a conflict of interest for the rep body in its lawyers acting on specific land claims, or at worst, an impermissible use of relative power in terms of resources and respect of the federal court against the interests of the very people whose interest the rep body is meant to serve, that is, the relevant native title holders. In several matters, Chief Justice Mortimer has felt it necessary to call out a lack of accountability. In Tommy, a 2019 case about the status and privilege which may attach to an anthropological report, Her Honour remarked, in other words, WIMAC, which was the rep body in, in that case, positively accepted that none of the groups it contended were the clients of the WIMAC lawyers for the purposes of legal professional privilege had been given access to the Sackett overlap report, and neither did it appear to accept they could or should have been given access. It seems to me that this is an extraordinary position, that no client said to hold legal professional privilege has been shown the report, and some have been positively refused access, and none of this conduct is occurring on any instructions from any other clients, rather on the unilateral decision of a WIMAC lawyer or others within WIMAC. That is also unclear. In matters involving the Kaurig people, Her Honour had occasion to admonish the rep body lawyers in that case for conduct Her Honour considered unfortunate. Unlike lawyers in private practice, lawyers in rep bodies have the land claim client and they report uh, to the board of the rep body. The interests of the board of the rep body and the land claim applicant may diverge. To whom is the rep body lawyer accountable when this divergence occur occurs? It is not clear to me. Again, Her Honour Chief Justice Mortimer in Tommy has urged lawyers in the native title system to be at all times conscious of who their client is. Her Honour makes it clear that, quote, in examining how a solicitor on the record in a proceeding for a party must behave, the focus is on the precise relationship which arises between that solicitor and his or her client. The solicitor must be clear about who the client is, for a rep body lawyer, this is particularly important when your employer is a corporation with a board. The fiduciary duties owed to the employer may on occasion cut across the fiduciary duties owed to the applicant. A conflict of duty and duty may arise, which may be very difficult to resolve given the different power relationships involved. Much has been written about the position of government employed lawyers, both with respect to legal professional privilege and duties owed to the court. The client is not hard to identify. It is the state acting through the relevant minister responsible for responding to native title claims. But given the complexity of the native title system and the pressures of being a model litigant, a native title lawyer in government labours under peculiar pressures as well. They must constantly be conscious of acting under instructions from the relevant department while accepting that state government policy in respect of particular claims may either be unclear, opaque or different from the standard policy settings. One thing that has never been clear to me is why the state in Queensland, say, consents to some claims and not others. When you ask Crown lawyers in particular proceedings why the state has decided either to go to trial or consent to the determination, you are told that it is a matter for the state and you should get your own legal advice on the matter. So in central Queensland, the Coa people's application was determined by consent, but the state took the Wangan and Jagalingu subsequently named the claremont Yando claimants, the Caringbal people, the Brown River people and the Gungaloo claimants to trial. When you ask practitioners operating in central Queensland why this is, no one seems to precisely know why. The state is currently undergoing a treaty process with the establishment of a truth-telling commission while fighting land claims in court. No one seems to see this as incongruous. It would be useful if the state was to provide some public explanation of decision-making which seems shrouded in mystery. Accountability to the people of a state and the requirement for the state to act as a model litigant, you might think, extends to a public explanation of native title policy in respect of particular cases. Perhaps I'm merely being naive. All of this has created winners and losers in the native title system, well before matters are put to judgment by this court. The losers, as I have said, do not understand why their knowledge of their identity has not been taken account of in putting a matter into court. There is a great unmet need to have explanations, to understand how they've missed out. These people seek answers, 
and want to try to unpick what has sewn them up into native title limbo. They want to return to court to find a place in the sun to settle scores with those they say they have not included them or are not right for country. But there is no funding except pro bono work and such matters are litigious, require enormous amounts of time and therefore cost and may ultimately have little or no prospects of success. One solution may be to provide some funding for a panel to assess such claims that may have limited powers to call witnesses and investigate egregious examples of injustice. But, this, but finding those particularly egregious examples may be difficult, and this suggestion is likely to founder in any event on the shoals of government policy and National Native Title Council opposition. I think there does need to be more transparency in rep body activities and in state activities for those whom those bodies are funded to serve. This could be legislated for. Some of the decisions referred to here, such as in Tommy, could form part of legislative change to ensure that transparency. Connection material should not be unnecessarily kept from proper scrutiny by those for whom the connection reports are prepared, namely the native title claimants. For instance, it could be legislated that connection reports are the property of the applicant, not the rep body, and that the applicants are able to decide the extent to which such material should be disseminated, if at all. Lastly, though, the legal profession is a self-regulating one. Each individual lawyer must examine their conscience at all times in making difficult ethical and legal decisions. They must at all times be clear about who their client is and must train those coming into the profession about these matters. This finally is the best bulwark to a less than punctilious attitude to accountability. We risk the oppression of numbers with whom the native title system has to date been able to afford to dispense with. That oppression of those missing out before matters even get to court is in my view too high a price to pay. We should address it in some way before the unmet need of those cut out becomes too much for them to bear and those people either lash out against the system or retreat into the despair of identities unrecognised and collection and connections lost. Thank you.